A week of grief as we witnessed the Manchester bombings and yesterday we witnessed the London incidents and a week of grief because we've seen what happened in Kabul and in Karada. So we do send our condolences to the families who lost their beloved ones on those occasions and on those events. And we also uh, send our heartfelt condolences to the people who lost yesterday um, in the tragic incident uh, in London. Now we also have another year of grief, a year of sadness in which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam lost two-thirds of the Islamic pillars. Many people around the world commemorate in these nights the passing of two individuals, Abu Talib, the Prophet's uncle, and a man of great character, and Lady Khadija, the Prophet's first wife, and the person who contributed the most to the success of Islam. In regards to Abu Talib, the, the, there is a huge debate on whether he died as a Muslim or as a Kafir. And of course, he is the father of Ali ibn Talib salam. But is this enough for his salvation? The second part of today's episode, we will look at how Lady Khadija is revered within the religion of Islam, as well as what were her contributions to Islam and the Muslims. And the last portion, as we usually have as the, third, the general Q&A, we left that out and dedicated the last portion, 20, 30 minutes, to talk about the incident what, of what happened in London yesterday. Uh, was uh, a brother from London. But inshallah we'll begin with Abu Talib. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Allah alaikum Sayyidina. Uh, we do can, uh, send our condolences to you uh, as well as the Muslim Ummah for the demise of Abu Talib as well as Lady Khadija alayhi salam. But beginning our discussion, as I mentioned, the debate of whether he died a Muslim or a Kafir still raises or still rises. Why, why is there a rage about him being you know, a Muslim or a Kafir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Of course, we send uh, our condolences to those people who have family members who have passed away in that horrific scene in London that we saw only last night. And that is my hometown. Mm -hmm. And whenever anything happens there, it hurts me as much as it hurts, should hurt anyone else in the world. And it's so poignant that we're also discussing two personalities who, when they died, it was a year of grief for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Now, when a person asks, why are people still wondering, is Abu Talib a Muslim or is Abu Talib a Kafir? Naturally, a person is brought up with a particular heritage. That heritage comes from literature, which has been inherited from one generation to another. If they have reverence for the writers of that piece of literature, then anything that they say about certain personalities is obviously going to be what generation after generation are going to be taught. Yes. So with many people who today may think that Abu Talib, for example, died as a disbeliever, it is only natural if they are only following the religion of their fathers and their fathers and their fathers who inherited sets of literature from the Abbasids onwards who may have had a particular animosity towards Abu Talib or indeed towards the children of Abu Talib. Yes. We know very well Abu Al-Faraj Al-Asfahani's famous work, Maqatil Al-Talibiyin, highlights that there was a great animosity towards the children of Abu Talib. Yes. As we know, the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt are the sons of Abu Talib. And there was certainly a lot of friction with the Abbasids, who were their cousins, yeah. but were the great-grandsons of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. So you've got the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, has a number of famous uncles, Abbas and Abu Talib and Hamza and Abu Lahab and so on. And naturally, when the Abbasids are going to be the empire where one may argue a lot of literature that we have today, your Sahih al-Bukharis, your Sahih Muslims, your Tirmidhis and Nasa'is and Abu Dawuds and Ibn Majahs and so on were all written in the period of the Abbasids, then that animosity may have been seen within the literature. When mm -hmm. it's seen within the literature, that literature is inherited from generation to generation. I don't want to generalize and say that every single Muslim out there who is not of the school of Ahlul Bayt believes that Abu Talib died as a disbeliever. No. There are a number of works which were written yes. and continue to be written mm -hmm. in praise and in honor of Abu Talib alayhi salam. 
But when you're asking me why does this debate continue to rage, it's because we inherit certain literature which still has the fragments of the animosities that certain yeah. empires had towards certain yes. personalities, and therefore this was taken out against their ancestors. Mm -hmm. Now, a question that is always asked uh, in regards to Prophet Muhammad or the Emma, we find that, you know, how does a 14-year-old individual character influence us as Muslims living in the 21st century? Now, does this question apply to Abu Talib as well? I mean, I, I, how does the life of Abu Talib, a 14-year uh, 1400-year yeah. uh, old character, influence our lives in what way? Well, I've heard this question many times, that why should we be discussing, for example, people who died a thousand years ago? Exactly. Well, ask the Lord of Islam why he kept on discussing personalities who lived a few thousand years before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Mm -hmm. In the Quran, how many times does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to reflect upon the story of Adam? Adam was 10 days before the Prophet Muhammad? Thousands of years. Why does he tell us to reflect on the story of Noah, the story of David and Solomon, Abraham, Moses, Jesus? It's so that we're able to learn the lessons from their life. It's not a matter of a person just saying, well, you know what, Karbala happened a thousand years ago. What difference is it going to make in our lives today? What happened to Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Or Abu Talib died a thousand years ago. Who cares if Abu Talib is a Muslim or a Kafir? How does that affect our lives today? On the contrary, mm -hmm. let us learn the lessons of Abu Talib's life. Exactly. And also, let us show appreciation for the sacrifices that the likes of Abu Talib gave for this religion. Even when a person like Abu Talib has a line in his poetry, the great Allama Mazandarani has collected thousands of poems of Abu Talib alayhi salam. And in his line, لَن يَصِلُوا إِلَيْكَ بِجَمْعِهِمْ حَتَّى أُوَسَّدُ فِي التُرَابِ دَفِينَ There is no way any of them will reach you, O Muhammad, until there is dust gathered all over and I'm buried in the ground. Isn't that a wonderful example of sacrifice for the religion of Islam? Yes. When I'm studying Abu Talib and now I'm seeing myself living in difficult circumstances as a Muslim, I'm trying to defend the real image of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, but mm -hmm. I'm getting abused and attacked from every angle. Mm -hmm. When I hear these lines, لَن يَصِلُوا إِلَيْكَ بِجَمْعِهِمْ حَتَّى أُوَسَّدْ فِي التُرَابِ دَفِينَ When I see these lines of Abu Talib, I am inspired by these lines. I look at this man and I think, Subhanallah, Islam was only a religion of how many people at the time? Only a few, a handful. Yeah. And this man gave everything from himself for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. That's when history becomes real. Yes. I agree with those people who sometimes say, well, if lectures on history are purely about history and they don't relate to our lives today, what's the point? Exactly. But with Abu Talib, there is so much from his life that we're able to apply into the 21st century life, whether you're living in the West or in the East. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, inshallah, we can get to mention uh, a few points regarding that. But... A lot of people ask, you know, the people who pre-Islamically existed, uh, who was the father of Abu Talib and how influential was he back then? Well, uh, Abu Talib's father is, of course, the grandfather of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, mm -hmm. Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib. And we are adamant on our belief that these are all monotheists, not polytheists. Mm -hmm. The school of Ahlul Bayt is adamant. Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, they are all believers in one God never were disbelievers or never were polytheists, people who put partners to God. Shaykh al-Mufid has written a treatise on the belief of Abu Talib as well as Allama al-Amini, the author of Al-Ghadir, has written a wonderful, wonderful analysis of the belief of Abu Talib. And Abdul Muttalib's belief is clear for all of us to see. If I were to ask you which surah in the Quran mm -hmm. is the one that talks of an incident related to Abdul Muttalib's defense of the Kaaba, when it was about to be attacked by a certain group of animals. Feel. Feel, Hassan. Yeah. The elephant. Many of us know you Surah Al-Feel. 500 indications to that. I know, I had to add <laughs> so many clues because I wanted to make sure that you knew the no, answer. No, no, say that, come on. But I know, I know. You, you, you definitely are someone who would know that one. Now, when you're looking at Surah Al-Feel, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil? Feel. Feel. The story of the companions of the elephant, when Abraha came to attack the Kaaba, 
I ask every Muslim in the world today, who was it that defended the Kaaba with such calmness, collectivity, and an aura of class like Abdul Muttalib alayhi salam? Abdul Muttalib, while everyone around him was in a frenzy, rightly so, when you've got this ridiculously strong army coming with these elephants and they're about to come and destroy what you've pr prided yourself on all this time, and that is that you are the custodians of the Kaaba. Naturally, people were scared. Abdul Muttalib said to them, listen, calm down. Firstly, all of you gather together and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when somebody is oppressed, the distance between the heavens and the earth is the cry of an oppressed person in dua. Wow. Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. Ujibu da'wat ad-da'i da da'ani. When my servant asks you about me, tell them that I am near. I answer the supplication of the supplicant when they supplicate towards me. When they were attacking the Kaaba, Abdul Muttalib, when he goes to meet Abraha, Abraha is like, so this guy is Abdul Muttalib? They're like, yes. He welcomes him. He tells him, how can I look after you? How can I serve you? Just said to him, listen, the flock of my animals, I want them back. That's it. He said to him, sorry? He said, you got my animals, give them back to me. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm about to destroy the Kaaba. And you're telling me you want your animals back? How about that Kaaba? He said, the Kaaba has its own protector. Wow. That Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what Abu Talib mm -hmm. was raised with by his father, Abdul Muttalib. And that man, Abdul Muttalib, was truly the embodiment of a group of people who were living in Mecca who were known as Hanifs. Mm -hmm. The Hanifs were a group of monotheists. Khadija bin Khuwaylid, Abd al Muttalib, Abu Talib, amongst others who were purely on the belief of Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, Abraham, how did the Abrahamic covenant play a role in this? Well, the Abrahamic covenant, we know very well that Nabi Ibrahim, السلام, when he left Ismail and his mother Hajar in that vicinity of Mecca, that is the beginning of the leadership in the line of Ibrahim alayhi mm salam. -hmm. A lot of the world talks of leadership. When they talk of leadership, they normally talk of leadership in the line of Ishaq, son of Ibrahim. Yes. So the prophets of the children of Israel are normally seen as those who are from the line of Isaac. But no one mentions that wonderful line of Ismail alayhi salam and how Nabi Ibrahim, his father, had said, when his Lord had made him an Imam for the people, قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا I am making you an Imam for the people. Surah 2, verse 1, 2, 4. قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ How about my offspring? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the concept of Imam, uses a covenant, Ahd. Says, قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ أَحْدِيَ الظَّالِمِينَ My covenant of Imama, Wow. That God, divinely inspired, bestowed sovereignty of leadership will never reach the oppressor. Nabi Ibrahim, when Allah had made him an Imam, he could have just turned around to God and said, Thank you, God. But he said, Women Dhuriyati, how about my offspring? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran many times makes it clear. Mm -hmm. I'm not scared about putting leadership in one family. Yes. I've heard many times people throughout the years say to me, your belief in Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and the sons of Hussein, Ali ibn al-Hussein, Muhammad al-Bakr, Ja'far al-Sadiq, and so on, Ali salam, your belief in them is a monarchy. You guys, your imamate is a monarchy. And God doesn't like monarchies. So how about when God chose the line of Ibrahim to have Nubuwa? Weren't they all the sons of Ibrahim? Yeah. Why don't you say, why did God put prophethood in one family? Why when Imama is in one family, you're jealous of Imama? But when Nubuwa was in the sons of Abraham, you have a problem. Inna Allah astafa Adam, Nuh, Al Ibrahim, Al Imran. Allah chose Adam, Noah, the family of Abraham. Why doesn't God give leadership to everybody? Why only families? Because God knows where best to put his message. Of course. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Nabi Ibrahim, إِنِّي جَعَلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا Nabi Ibrahim replied, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّةِ How about my offspring? قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ أَحْدِيَ الظَّالِمِينَ My ahd, my covenant of imamah will never reach the 
oppressor because in his line there's people like Abu Lahab they're a Balim they're not going to be the ones who look after the religion of Islam yes. but in his line as well are the likes of Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib and that's why I'm not surprised when you see that Abdul Muttalib has sons like Abdullah and Abu Talib Abdullah has Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Abu Talib has Ali Rasulullah has who Fatima and that beautiful line continues and that's why Muslims around the world you'll find many of them will say Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi oh Allah send your blessings upon Muhammad and his family like you sent on Abraham and his family wow. you find therefore that God had made a covenant and that covenant continued all the way to Abdul Muttalib and then Abu Talib and that's why in Shi'i thought we don't just see Abu Talib as the uncle of the Prophet peace be upon him his family we see him as a custodian of the divine light of Abraham other schools in Islam maybe say Abu Talib good Abu Talib disbeliever Shi'ism we don't just look at him oh he's uncle of the Prophet Muhammad that means he has to be respected Abu Lahab is uncle of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him his family but Abu Lahab died as a disbeliever mm -hmm. Abu Talib is not just a physical or not just someone who's a personality of an Arab origin but he is a carrier of the divine light of Ibrahim alayhi mm salam. -hmm. Now we have a question regarding to the Kaaba. Uh, briefly, uh, Ali Salim he says, uh, can you say which one, who, who was the one who built the Kaaba first, Ibrahim or Adam? No, Adam is seen as the first to have begun the structure of the Kaaba. And, and then over time, there has been different developments of building work and stages mm -hmm. in relation to the Kaaba. Yes. Nabi Ibrahim notably is mentioned in the Holy Quran as the one who as building the yeah. Kaaba with his son Ismail. Was it reconstruction? And it's been reconstructed a number of times. Uh -huh. There have been floods in the time preceding the announcement of the Prophet of Muhammad, peace be upon his family. There was a tax on the Kaaba by Yazid, son of Muawiyah, yes. when he ordered the Kaaba to be attacked. There were periods in the Umayyad dynasty where there was a reconstruction of the Kaaba. So there's been a number of stages, but the origin and the foundations are with Nabi Adam alayhi mm salam. -hmm. Now, did people at that time do Hajj? People at that time used to perform Hajj. And it was the family of Abdul Muttalib who were in charge of the protection of the people, the giving out mm -hmm. the water. But the Hajj at that time had to be revamped completely when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, performed his one and only Hajj. As wow. we know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, uh -huh. He only performed one Hajj. That was his farewell, and it was his, the only Hajj. In the time of Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib, sadly, while Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib were all Hanifs, all believers in the path of Ibrahim, السلام, all submitters to God, there was slowly the beginning of the pollution of idol worship in Meccan society. People would come and put their idols. Some would do tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Wow. Some used to splash blood of their sacrifices on the Kaaba. Others used to go around the Kaaba gossiping and backbiting one another. And that's why you find in the Holy Quran, whether Surah Al Hajj, whether, for example, Surah Al Baqarah, whether other places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to guide those group of people who jahiliya ignorance has affected. By telling them that I gave you this honor of being the custodians of the Kaaba. I gave you the honor of having Abraham's lineage there. And the remains of the artifacts of Ismail buried in the ground. And Zamzam water. Yes. And now this is the way you behave in Hajj. Wow. The Hajj was like, a, you know, was like a 40 day affair and people would come from far and wide. But now you had loan sharks over there who were charging interest on the money of the people when the people were losing their money. And so sadly, the Hajj had gone far away from the principles of Ibrahim salam. But there was one family, and it was a family of light. And that was the family of Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, and Abdullah alayhim salam. Alayhim salam. Now, a lot of people wonder, when did the relationship between Abu Talib and Prophet Muhammad begin? Well, it's interesting to see that the relationship begins from the day he's born. Prophet from the Muhammad. day he's born, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the Prophet Muhammad is born, his father's already dead. Uh -huh. Abdullah had died while the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, his mother Amina was still pregnant with him. Mm -hmm. 
And you find that from the very first days there was an affiliation and a wonderful relationship between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, even as a toddler with his uncle Abu Talib. Mm -hmm. But naturally at the time, his mother Amina was looking after him. When Amina died, you found that Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad, looked after him. Mm -hmm. When Abdul Muttalib passed away, that's when Abu Talib began to look after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Wow. Now, there were other uncles who were around, but already there was a sense of love from Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad, the beloved wife of Abu Talib, wow. that lady who gave us the I wonderful sons, notably Ja'far al Tayyar, notably Ali, hmm. son of Abu Talib. Fatima bint Asad, as we know, is one of the greatest women in the history of this religion. Yes. A pious believer, purest lady you'll find. A lady who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day would honor by having the Kaaba open so that she gives birth to Ali inside the Kaaba. Allah. Abu Talib and Father of Asad from a young age say, We will look after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. And so you find this blossoming relationship. Of course, later on. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon his family repays the favor that when Arabia is affected now by difficult times, yeah. he says, I'll bring up Ali, don't worry. The way that you brought me up, the oh, way wow. that you raised me. You find therefore that from that beginning, from that young age, Abu Talib, wherever he traveled, he'd take the Prophet Muhammad with him. Mm -hmm. Because there's the famous story about the traveling which you know in those days, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ In the winter, they'd go towards Yemen. In the summer, they'd go towards Syria, the mm -hmm. Arabs, for merchandise and trade and so on. And Abu Talib alayhi salam was a businessman as well. He had to find a means of income. Of course. There's no embarrassment. There's no embarrassment. Prophets of God, all of them used to work. Nabi Idris was a tailor. Nabi Musa was a shepherd. Nabi Isa, Jesus was a carpenter. The Holy Prophet Muhammad slowly started to learn the value that worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also comes through work when he would accompany his uncle Abu Talib. And we have stories which are presented in the books of history. Mm -hmm. And they're open for discussion, but we have stories where people begin to notice that this young man walking with Abu Talib is a man who's very different to all those around him. And there's this oft-mentioned story, which the historians give their opinions on. But if we were to narrate it and we leave the historians to dissect the reliabilities, when they come across the monk, mm -hmm on their travels and their sojourns towards Syria, yes. they come across the monk who tells Abu Talib, I want to invite you and that young man with you to my house tomorrow. But make sure he comes with you. When he invites him over towards the house, he tells Abu Talib, where's the young man? He said, he's over there. He said, please bring him. When he brings him, he looks at the young prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. He says to him, I ask you by Allah to Al-Uzza. The prophet turns around to him and says, do not mention these names, for they are the most detested to me. They were two of the major names of the Quraysh. How old was he? Six years of age, eight wow. years of age. Some say 11, 12 years of so age, I, if after Abdul Muttalib has died. A small child. Young, let's say 11, 12. Then he says, verily, this man is the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who what? Who Jesus, son of Mary, foretold will come. We know in the Quran, yes. Nabi Isa talks of Ahmed coming after him. Abu Talib says, what gave you the signs? He said, number one, the fact that he says, Allah wal Uzza are the most detested. Number two, the mark of prophethood. 
between his shoulders. Number three, when I saw him walk, I saw the trees bow down before him when he walked past them. And I knew that that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Wow. I knew that that is the Prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And he said, Abu Talib, protect him. For there are people in your land who will want to kill him and who will oppose his message and not believe that he's the final messenger of God. Mm -hmm. So in this young age, you find that Abu Talib becomes a father figure to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. And what many Muslims do not know is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, is facing already people who want to attack him even before he's announced his prophethood. Wow. Many times people assume that the Prophet Muhammad was only attacked after the age of 40 when he announces his prophet. Yes, there's an increase in the attacks. But the main attacks on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, you will find there is a number of them that occur when he's young because there are people who begin to notice that this person stands out. And some are worried that he's going to announce something in the future which may oppose their teachings. Mm -hmm. And believe you me, there was a number of attempts to try and take his life even at a young age. Mm -hmm. And always in his way, oh, Abu, Talib. Abu Talib. Always protecting him, Abu Talib. Abu Talib. Always a pillar of strength, Abu Talib. My dear brother Ahmed, when the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and family says that the year which Abu Talib died is Aam al Huzd, is a year of grief. Imagine what memories are recollected. Oh, yeah when he remembers what his uncle did for him. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we have a, a question that uh, a lot of people, this person is saying, uh, there are some from the Sunni school of thought, believe that the parents of Prophet Muhammad died as non-Muslims. How did they come up with this conclusion? There are some, yes, it's true. Not all. Some. Some. There is the a Sunni, number yeah. of our Sunni brothers who will adopt Qadi Abu Bakr's famous opinion. Mm -hmm where he says anyone who tells you the Prophet Muhammad's parents are disbelievers, whip them. Ah. Ah. That's from our brothers from Ahl-Sunnah. Qadi Abu Bakr, renowned scholar, himself made it clear that whoever says the Prophet Muhammad's parents are disbelievers, whip them. Now, I'm not going to say to the listeners, go out and whip people. Well, of course There's no not. need for any whips. What I am going to say is, that some say, well, the Prophet Muhammad would tell people that my father is in hell and your father is in hell. We do not accept these traditions at all. Mm -hmm. Abdullah and Amina were both of the Hanifs, believers in the oneness of God. And we have numerous traditions from Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. And even in our, not only in the Quran, that you are of those who came from the loins of those who prostrated to God. Yes. But also in some salutations we have in the school of Ahlul Bayt, when we talk to Imam al Hussein, Ashadu Annaka Kunta Nuran, Fil Aslab, Shamikha, Wal Arham, Mutaha, Lam Tuna Jiskal Jahiliya Bi and Jasiha, Walam Tul Biskam and Mudlehim Mati, Thiabiha. You find, therefore, that in the school of Ahlul Bayt, all of us are adamant mm -hmm. of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, mm -hmm. are not just believers, but even for my dear brother out there who says to me, that you know Abu, uh, Abdullah and Amin are going to burn in hell, no problem. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is the king of Shafa'a. I'm sure he'll look after mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. Now, some may argue that chapter 9 verse 113, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that the Prophet cannot ask for the forgiveness of the mushrikeen or mushrik, even if that means from his family, because we do know that the Prophet had some mushrikeen within his family, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do not ask for forgiveness from those uh, mushrikeen from your family. How does this apply to Abu Talib? Yeah, they say that Surah 9 verse... A lot verse, of mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, they say Surah 9 verse 113 is revealed about Abu Talib uh -huh. salam. وَمَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا لِقُرْبَى It is not fitting for the Prophet and those who believe to ask for forgiveness for the polytheists even if it's their relatives. So some of our brothers in other schools in Islam, not all, remember? Yes, some. Some out there say that this Surah 9 verse 113 is revealed about Abu Talib. Mm -hmm. That the Prophet Muhammad wanted to ask for forgiveness for his uncle. And so Allah said, it's not fitting for the Prophet to ask for forgiveness, even if someone's your relative, if they're a polytheist. Abu Talib died three years before Hijrah. 
This verse was revealed a couple of years before the Prophet, peace be upon him, passed away in the 11th year after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. That means that this verse was revealed at least 12 years after Abu Talib died. What was there? An email communication issue with the heavens at that time? Was Wi-Fi not working properly? What was happening at that time? Because I see Wi-Fi is working in Halab fantastically these days in Twitter accounts. Everyone's got brilliant Wi-Fi from Aleppo yeah. where they're able to all suddenly tweet straight away and the Allah. best of Wi-Fi. So what, are you telling me that the heavens at that time did not have good Wi-Fi? Because war-torn countries are having magnificent Wi-Fi. But the heavens, 12 years late, were they in their Wi-Fi? 12 years, the connection was bad. Iraq has good Wi-Fi, but the heavens decides that, you know what? Um, just before the Prophet Muhammad dies, let's reveal an eye about Abu Talib who died 12, 13 years before. Wow. This has nothing to do with Abu Talib. But what began to happen in the world of Quranic, you know, exegesis is that yes. every Tom, Dick and Harry, especially those who hate Ali. Allah, th that's why they attack him so yeah. much. I remember the ayah in the Quran, عُتُلِّ مِنْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ زَنِيمٌ That verse was revealed about Walid ibn al-Mughira. That verse, when it was revealed about Walid ibn al-Mughira, the Mufassir says, don't attack Walid too much because his son is Khalid. So you shouldn't attack him too much because his son was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Even though God has attacked Walid ibn al-Mughira in many other places. These are all about Walid ibn al-Mughira. Wow. He says, don't attack Walid because Walid, his father, his son is Khalid. But with Ali, attack his dad as much as you want. Wow. As in with Ali ibn Abi Talib, attacking Abu Talib is normal. But Walid ibn Mughira don't attack because Khalid says, so what? You don't have any feelings for Imam Ali? But I don't blame you if you don't have feelings for Imam Ali. Because it became normal to fight Imam Ali at Jamal and Safin and this companion, that companion, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at the Quran, you'll find that such ayahs <coughs> have got nothing to do with Abu Talib at all. Mm -hmm. Now, we see Abu Talib also being present at the Nikah of Prophet Muhammad. And that also links to Khadija. Uh, so, how was Khadija? Well, you look at the Nikah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, and it highlights to you. Yes. That firstly, those who were pure monotheists, who were all believers in one God, were now a small community. They all knew each other. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, has started to work for Khadija in what was her thriving business that she inherited from her father Khuwaylid and her mother Fatima. Thirdly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is not going to get a mushrik from Quraysh to read his nikah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is not going to get someone who worships idols in Quraysh to read his nikah with Khadija. He's going to get one of the people who are of the Hanifs. Mm -hmm. Of course. A person who's a believer in one God. Of course. A person who's a believer in the message of Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and da David and Solomon and Moses and Jesus. Because in the whole Nikah ceremony, those were the words of Abu Talib. Wow. Abu Talib's words when he read the Nikah of the Prophet wasn't just, okay, do you accept to marry him, Khadija? Yes, I do. Prophet, Qabiltu, done. Okay, let's have a meal. No. There was the fragrance of monotheism which was smelt all around Mecca on the day the Prophet peace be upon him and his family married Khadija and the man the Prophet wanted to administer that nikah ceremony was whom? Abu Talib wow. and that's why I'm not surprised when the likes of Zaini Dahlan and, the Bar and Barzanji and contemporaries Hassan Saqqaf or Hassan Farhan al-Maliki well, there are others even from the Maliki school who when they look at hadiths about Abu Talib, they say these hadiths are ahad and we don't take the ahad hadiths when it comes to a conclusion on someone's aqidah. You know, the Ash'arites and the Maturidis and so on, they differ 
between the different theological schools in yes. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, where the Ahad traditions are able to constitute certainty for an, uh, conclusion in Aqidah. Mm -hmm. If we can say what the Ahad are? Sure, you have, for, you have for example, you're looking at certain narrations which have been narrated from a wide variety of angles. Uh -huh. And they've reached the level of Tawatur. Uh -huh. Ma'nawi or lovely requires its own uh, discussions. You've got these traditions that are so many. Then you've got these one-off traditions that have not reached the levels of Tawatur. Mm -hmm. yes. So therefore, when you're coming towards such traditions, our brothers Ahlul Sunnah, not all of them say Abu Talib is a disbeliever. No. You'll find that contemporary scholars have say either, let's not go there. Don't say that Abu Talib, don't do takfir on Abu Talib. Or others say, no, Abu Talib is a believer. And if there is a hadith in the Sahih about Abu Talib, maybe burning in hell, but a punishment which is lighter than everybody else, they say these hadiths are ahad, they're not to be taken for aqidah. Mm -hmm. Now that requires us to go into the different into, schools yeah. and their theologies. Uh -huh. The point being what? Nikah, Abu Talib recited Khadija and the Holy Prophet. I remember someone saying, well, the laws of Nikah about someone being a believer all came after uh, the Quran was revealed. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad married Khadija before the Quran was revealed. Therefore, it makes no difference. It does. Every moment of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is a moment calculated for the future of the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, Hassan Ali says, what age uh, did Khadija get married to Prophet Muhammad? See, normally people try and say that Khadija was 15 years older than the Prophet Muhammad. So they say she was 40 and the Prophet Muhammad was 25. I tend to go with the opinion that their ages are much closer uh, to one another. If there is any difference, it may be a couple of years maximum. Mm -hmm. Now, how was she for uh, a source of reform uh, within the Islamic community? Oh, this lady was, was the most magnificent lady you will find um, in the history of the religion of Islam. I'm not surprised that when you, know, you speak about the four women of heaven, it's always Mary, Asiya, wife of Pharaoh, Khadija, and Fatima Zahra. These four are in a different league to any other woman that lived at that time. Different league altogether. And you would find that this lady wasn't just a businesswoman. She's one of those ladies who, you know today, there are many businesses that have pro bono work. Yes. There are businesses that do charitable projects. This was envisaged by Khadija al-Kubra alayhi salam. The lady was called a Tahira. She was pure to the extent that people said this is Amirat Quraysh, the, you know, the queen or the princess of Quraysh. She used to stand up for the rights of women who knew that their husbands wanted to bury their babies alive because they were females. Remember we discussed this a few nights ago? A few nights ago. That we said in Arabia it was normal to bury your daughter alive because your daughter is a female. female. You would find that Khadija al-Kubra would be the first to be outspoken. Khadija al-Kubra would come forward and state to all the women, if any of you are scared that you've given birth, you know it's a girl, and you know some of these Arab men are burying their daughters alive. And the Quran is saying, And the Quran will say, These were verses that were revealed later, way before they were revealed. Khadija al-Kubra herself was already saying to the woman, any of you need shelter for your newborn baby? Come knock at my door. Was this before her marriage or after her marriage? Before. Before her marriage? Before. As was Jahiliya. Jahiliya is pre-Islam and its announcement. Already these people were burying their daughters alive. Wow. And Khadija would say, I don't care what time, time of night it is. That's why it will be wonderful when Muslims want to talk about Islam. Put prayers and these things on the side and the acts of worship. Talk of the social work that was instituted by the likes of Khadija al-Kubra alayhi salam. Try and open a place of shelter for ladies who are domestically abused. Try and open a place of shelter for ladies who have nowhere to go and they've given birth. Try and open a place of shelter for women in the world who are being violently treated. You know, there are some parts of the world where there are incidents and reporting of incidents of rape every hour. Yeah. And there are women with nowhere to go. Khadija al-Kubra from the very beginning of this religion, why do you think the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon his family cried in the year that Abu Talib and Khadija al-Kubra died? Why do you think he cried? Because wow. the foundations of Islam, of not just monotheism, but of social Islam, a real living Islam was seen with Khadija. And I tell you, there were moments where her doors would knock early hours of the morning 
And there'd be a lady who would come and she said, what's in your bag? She said, my newborn baby. Wow. She said, don't worry, keep him here. So there was a social aspect to this lady, which really is inspirational, inshallah, for many ladies and mm -hmm. gents in the Muslim community today. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, Khadija was a businesswoman and she was one of the more prominent businesswomen uh, back then, one of the richest. Um, what can she teach us? Or what can we learn from her treatment to her employees? I think one thing is she's not stingy. <laughs> Believe you me, you have, you know, you got people yeah. out there who are Muslims. Believe you me, they'll cut costs as much as they can. Yeah. And that's understandable in any business, you know, project and any business plan. But they will see people who will do work for dirt cheap. And they'll make wow. sure that those guys virtually die in the way they treat them. Sayyidah Khadija was known to double the commission of her workers on any good performance. Do well, double. Do well, double. Not stingy. Because you know, stinginess is one of the spiritual diseases. It is. Remember a few nights ago we, we said about, we have physical yeah. diseases in Islam, but we have spiritual diseases. Envy, arrogance, hypocrisy, stinginess. Racism. Racism. All of these are spiritual diseases. If ever you want to see Sayyidah Khadija, number one, trustworthiness and truthfulness. Allah. As was her husband and being a Sadiq al Amin. I mean. But number two, not stingy. Help them. Let them build up. Let them have a chance where they feel that I'm not exploiting them. It was a wonderful outlook in the world of business. Mm -hmm. Now, which were the other ladies, uh, either during the time or prior to the time of Lady Khadija? We, we, we did mention that uh, Lady uh, Asya, Maryam, uh, Khadija, and Lady Fatima and Zara yeah. al-Islam. But were there other ladies that of were also present? Of course, there were a few ladies who deserve special mentions. Mm -hmm. Asma bint Umais, mm -hmm. unbelievable lady. Asma bint Umais, her life was a dedication to the religion of Islam. And you know, Sayyidah Khadija, in those days when it became difficult because she was the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his So when he announces his prophethood, there are certain ladies, you know, your Hinds and your Um Jamils, these are ferocious women. Yeah. You don't want to get on the wrong side of Um Jamil, wife of Abu Lahab, and Hind, wife of Abu Sufyan. And if they want to gossip, they'll make the ladies in the story of Nabi Yusuf look like people who are angels. Wow. Now, Sayyidah Khadija has Asma bint Umayyis. Asma bint Umayyis comes from a renowned family. Her sisters are married to renowned personalities. Yet, that Asma Khadija relies on her as a backbone. Sumayya, mother of Ammar bin Yasir. Yes. Wonderful lady. Outstanding. The first martyr in the history of the religion of Islam. A lady who, however much she was tortured, never gave in to the torture of Abu Jahl and Bani Makhzum. When you look at these two ladies, you find a third lady, Um Ayman, who the Prophet used to regard as Barakah because she looked after him and protected him. Halim al saadiyah another of those yes. who were monotheists, believers in the oneness of God. So there were a number of ladies. And then the icing on the cake, her daughter Fatima al Zahra. Mm -hmm. Now speaking of Fatima al Zahra, a lot of people mentioned that Khadija was married before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, I'll let you talk about that. And did they also have other children than Fatima Zahra? Yeah, so there's an opinion that she was twice widowed or she was twice married before. We don't take that as a unanimous opinion in the school of Ahlul Bayt. We believe that her first husband and only husband is the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. As for the question of the number of children they had, the ulama differ on this in their debates. Some of them say the only daughter and the only child of the of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, of course, who continued to live because they had boys who died in infancy. Yes. You know, when we hear about Qasim and Ibrahim and Tahir and so on, we hear these names. These are... Those were Khadija's sons? Yes. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was, was, was insulted by the Arabs who kept on saying, Inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. Yeah. You were calling him abtar. abtar they were yeah. calling him abtar. Abtar. Abtar, the, an animal, if its tail is cut off, that's abtar. So these guys were calling, especially Al-As bin Wa'il, Amr's father, yeah. Amr ibn Al-As. Oh. His father would shout, Abtar, Abtar, you whose line is cut off because the, boy, the infant boys would die. And Allah says, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. We have given you abundance. And Fatima and her progeny is the abundance. Others say, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, had other daughters such as Ruqayya and Zainab and Umm Kulthum. There is discussion from either side. Some who have tried to say those aren't his daughters. Those are the daughters of Khadija's sister, Hala, 
But we have traditions which say that those were the daughters. But suffice for us to know that that has no effect on the greatness of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And Fatima Zahra is the one who survives him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the Prophet, uh, all they have, like you know, we have the Sha'b of Abu Talib and you have mm. the, the economic sanctions mm. uh, that was going on, that was placed uh, on uh, the Prophet's uh, house. Yes. I mean, can you, can you talk about that? When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family this, uh, is now designated to announce the message of the religion of Islam. He is mm -hmm. now the Prophet of God. He has come with the message of the Abrahamic prophets who have come before him. This causes uproar. Yes. Listen, your Abu Jahls, your Utba bin Rabi'ahs, your Walid ibn al-Mughiras, your Abu Sufyans, your Abu Lahabs, these were aristocrats. They were running a society who they made believe that they were worshippers of idols like them, but in many cases they weren't even worshipping anything. Wow. Idol worship, subjugate the poor, make them believe that these idols which you carve out of stone can do things for them. The Arabs used to love their idols. You know, they take istikhara with their idols. Yeah, yeah they put like a piece of they put like a bowl there, istikhara. put three yeah. Put three pieces of papers, if Allah, if Allah, and for example, like Wasat, we have an istikhara. Wow. And the Arabs would actually, believe you me, the Arabs would actually take istikhara with this idol. And you'd find also they'd go and feed the idols, you know, za'faran, saffron. Yeah. They'd go and put za'faran there, and you know, the flies would love that. The flies would come and steal all the za'faran. Wow. And you imagine a man suddenly rises who says, No more. Qulhu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Say God is one, needless, yes, neither begets nor is begotten, and there is none like him. A man who comes and tells them that these idols that you worship uh, can neither harm you or benefit you. A man who's reminding them, you claim to know Nabi Ibrahim because you look after the Kaaba, he smashed the idols. Now you should do the same. You're messing with us now, Muhammad. You'll see what we'll do to you. First thing, torture his companions, Bilal, Ammar bin Yasser, others. Second thing, no, we'll kill the new Muslims, Sumayya, Ammar bin Yasser. Third thing, we'll force the Muslims to migrate out of here. Ja'far al-Tayyar and his wife, Asma bint Umais, have to migrate to Abyssinia. Fourth thing, when you want to really hurt a country, you put, a you put sanctions on them. So the whole world is trading with each other, but won't trade with you. Wow. Look anywhere in the world, when one country wants to destroy another, put economic sanctions on them. I don't care if your kids are going to starve to death, I'm going to put economic sanctions on you. I don't care if you can't produce, if you can't trade, economic sanctions on you. When they started to put these economic sanctions, Abu Talib and Khadija, as the backbones of this religion emerged. And that's why I always say, name your children Khadija, name your children Abu Talib. Today I hear, I hear some names, I don't even know where they've come from. Like it, it sounds like a name someone bought out of a lullaby in Disney or something. You know, bring, your, bring up your children. When you look at your daughter, you're like, you know what? She reminds me of that Khadija who sacrificed everything in the Sha'ab of Abu Talib. Or when I look at my son and call him Abu Talib or Talib, this reminds me, or name Ali or Ja'far or Aqil. This reminds me of Abu Talib alayhi salam. Abu Talib had a valley. It was known as Sha'ab Abu Talib. Said, you know what? All of you come to my valley. You know, sometimes when Muslims are persecuted, even if Muslims own good amount of land, you'll find the person will say, well, you know, I still need to make money from my land and so on. Abu Talib said, don't worry. Come and stay in my land. Khadija, a woman of wealth, would make sure that everyone can eat. She'll live on eating the grass or the weeds on the ground. Wow. You know, a few nights ago when people asked me about hijab, I remember someone said, how can I persuade myself or encourage myself to wear the hijab? I say, everybody has an Ismail in their life. Nabi Ibrahim's Ismail was his son. How is Ismail the hijab? Someone's Ismail, someone's sacrifice may be the hijab. Something that you don't want to do. But if it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you do it for the love of the Lord. 
Khadija doesn't want to be eating grass or weeds while others are eating what they can eat in those difficult economic sanctions. But you know what? If it keeps the message of Islam alive and ensures that Allah's light continues to grow, then so be it. That was her Ismail. Yes. Everyone has an Ismail. Everyone has a moment where they ask themselves how much are they willing to sacrifice for the love of God? Something which in any other time they would not do. But because it's for God, they do it. Yes. Believe you me, she sacrificed so much. And Abu Talib, you know what he was saying at that time? Ali, sleep in the bed of your prophet. I'd rather see you dead than your prophet alive. Look at that sacrifice. How then do you call this man a disbeliever? Wow. How do you call him a disbeliever? I've heard so many lectures on Abu Talib. They say, good man, you know, good. But at the end, they didn't become Muslim. How do you call him a disbeliever? Khadija. That lady of wealth in Arabia ends up dying without having a kafan. Mm -hmm. Me and you, who've done nothing for the religion, will die with a kafan on our body. Said Khadija, no kafan. Wow. And she asked Asma bint Umar, asked Fatima Zahra, if I don't have a kafan, let the Prophet, his cloak, let it be placed on my body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you think he'd let Khadija go passing away with that? Allah orders Jibra'il, take a kafan for Khadija. Wow. That lady who had the whole of this world in her hands, and there are many out there. Their parents are wealthy. They are wealthy. Best cars, best houses, best everything. But there's a moment when you have this Ismail moment. How much am I willing to sacrifice for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for myself? And believe you me, that lady, do you know how many tears came trickling from the eyes of the Prophet, peace be upon his family? when he had to bury Khadija. And one thing he thought to himself, how will Fatima be? On the day that she's married, every woman wants her mom with her. Wow. And Fatima Zahra, when her mom died, was five. She was orphaned at five. Subhanallah, how much sacrifice this lady gave. That's why Rasulullah never would forget her. Always, where's Hala, the sister of Khadija? Go and give something to her. Give something to Hala's children. Look after them. Aisha one day got angry. Why you always mention that old lady? Why? Because she believed in me when no one else did. Wow. She trusted me when no one else did. And she gave me Fatima. No other wife. Gave me no Fatima. other wife. Name me the wives. Um Salama, Um Habiba, Aisha, Hafsa, Zainab. Name me the wives. Maria al Qutiyah. None of them gave a child who remained alive and left such a legacy in this religion like Khadija when she gave Fatima Zahra mm -hmm. Now this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or as it's known uh, for, by Prophet Muhammad if it wasn't for the piety of Abu Talib, the wealth of Khadija and the sword of Abu Talib, Islam would not have continued. Never. And perfectly you mentioned right there how Khadija and Abu Talib contribute together uh, to the success of Islam. But we have to take a short break and we'll continue after the short break. So respected viewers, do stay tuned for you will be presented with a short break. Live footages from the Holy Shrine of the Moon of Bani Hashim, Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him. After that, uh, we have promised for every night General Kuyane. But tonight, we will not have them because we have dedicated to the London incidents yesterday. Uh, and inshallah, we'll be joined by uh, a brother from London. So do stay tuned uh, for that after the break.
من را مرا رو به سوی بار لا Respected viewers, welcome back. Hope you, inshallah, uh, enjoyed that short report. And do take the opportunity in these reports to send your salutations upon uh, the moon of Bani Hashim and Imam Hussain alayhi salam. But now we are joined with Mustafa Field, one of the most uh, prominent. Ah, inshallah. So uh, he will be on the line soon. Mustafa Field, uh, one of the leading uh, Muslim uh, people in the community uh, in London. Uh, but Sayyidna. We continue <laughs> our discussion until we yes. get Mustafa Field uh, on the phone. Yesterday, uh, an incident happened. Yes. Where a lot of people are beginning to be scared and scared because things are changing now. We're going from bombs, to someone running out of a car with machetes, someone you know running over people on the side road. What's going on? Well, I spoke about this in my lecture on ISIS a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I spoke about this last Muharram. And I made it clear that sadly, with the type of rhetoric, type of literature we have in some of our mosques in the UK, do not be surprised of people being indoctrinated. It's not the only factor, but it's one of the major factors. And we'll come to discuss the Wahhabi Salafi ideology. Inshallah. And its spread and its tentacles and what it teaches, inshallah, in the forthcoming shows. Mm -hmm. But our prayers are with the people. And we hope the people realize that these are never the teachings of the religion of Islam. And let the people also realize in London that we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, are the victims of the horrors and the attitude and the atrocities and the violence of these very people. We, who are Muslims, are victims of these people's terror. We are. Sometimes a person thinks these people are, are only fighting non-Muslims. We are mm -hmm. victims of their terror. Yes. And so I pray for their families. Mm -hmm. Now, well, we do have Mustafa Field, uh, a prominent figure uh, within the Islamic community in London. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, very well, brother. Allah simple. If we can get the, just the volume a little bit higher. Yes, brother. Um, what's the latest news there? How are Muslims being treated in, in, in London and UK? I think uh, we are facing a very difficult time. Firstly, uh, uh, you know, our heart goes to the victims and their families. This is really a, 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 a brutal and cowardly attack. We see... Daesh and their similar ideologues, how they've you know, committed crimes we saw in Iraq, in Kabul, in Egypt, just this week in the holy month of Ramadan, a month that's sacred to all Muslims, a month that we should not be um, you know, fighting, we look at a month of peace exactly. and a month of you know, reflection yes. and contemplation. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing many Muslims who are very concerned about the rise of hate crime uh, and Islamophobia. But we need to also respond to this evil ideology uh, and, and, and challenge it. Mm -hmm. Because we know where its source is from. And it's, it's corrupting the minds of many vulnerable young Muslims. Yes. Now, Sayyid Ammar a few years ago mentioned in his lecture uh, on ISIS uh, that the, the attacks, uh, because of the literature which indoctrinates youth, and makes them, you know, more fearful. Now, what do you think about that? I think uh, it's very important that Muslim youth are, are, are able to learn to differ in opinions and, and understanding. It's critical that we're exposed to critical thinking. Uh, in particular, uh, our brothers in the Ahlul Sunnah struggle with uh, living with others. Uh, and minorities, and this is a challenge amongst a, a fringe within Ahl Sunnah, but they have a very strong 
propaganda machine, well funded, that is you know, attracting their youth. Uh, and, and much of this radicalization is not taking place uh, in the mosque but on, online. Mm-hmm. And there's very little that's been done to tackle this uh, in that sphere. Yes. Now, what has the Shia community done in London uh, in, uh, about these attacks? I, I, I was there today with many of the Shia youth uh, to stand in solidarity with the Londoners in this difficult time, but also to represent the true teachings of Islam. That Islam is a religion of peace, and Islam, you know, we, we, we are a religion that promotes tolerance and, you know, service and caring, especially in the month of Ramadan. Our humanity comes out very strongly. This is a month that we should be bringing peace, but we see groups like Daesh and, and many other groups that we see in Syria who are committing horrific crimes in the name of Islam, an insult to the sacred teachings in the Quran and, and you know, the prophetic teaching. Yes, now, since you mentioned Daesh and, and, and the view that they have, uh, of the people view have uh, of Daesh and ISIS, a lot of people, a lot of sisters, when they go wearing the hijab, a lot of people would tend to, you know, be fearful from them, not talk to them. So what advice do you give the sisters uh, who are wearing hijab and, and, and walk on, on in London? I think we have a duty to reach out to our non-Muslim neighbors, to share with them, invite them into our mosques. We should engage with them and share with them the true teaching of Islam. And yes. also show to them that we are the biggest victims of ideology like Daesh. This ideology has murdered hundreds of thousands uh, of Muslims uh, and, and particular followers of Ahl al-Bayt uh, to spread their, their hatred and, and to establish their distorted understanding of an Islamic state. Mm-hmm. Now, keeping in mind that uh, right now is, is election time uh, in, in London, now how does this affect uh, the elections, the, 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 the recent British elections, does it affect it in a positive or a negative way? I think it's a, a challenge because election times, everyone's going to be looking for gaining political points in this time. Yes. And uh, much of the rhetoric is uh, not of understanding. Um, and, you know, people feel uh, tired of these attacks. Uh, on, 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 on European soil, in, in Britain, uh, and there's a real fear that our way of life is, uh, is changing and people are exhausted from it. And so, unfortunately, uh, as well as the Hibet, well, we all, you know, we are identified as Muslims and we will, fall, we will be victims to some of the policies developed to address uh, this radicalization. And what we really need to do is confront the teachings that have corrupted the mind of the youth, but also enlighten them with the true teachings of tolerance that we find in Islam. We need to step up as Shias to preserve the true, true teachings of Islam and, yes. and make sure that our voice is, is strong and loud and clear in British society. Often the Shia, because of our oppression in many parts of the Muslim world, uh, we don't speak out, we don't reach out. We need to open up our community. We need to engage. We need to be at the center of civil society, in the center of uh, building bridges across different communities and different faiths. Mm-hmm. Now, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on, on the point you mentioned of, of reformation and confronting uh, the false teachings uh, of the people who uh, want to you know, just hijack the religion of Islam. Sayyidina, what would you like to say uh, to, to, to Mustafa Field? Well, all I would say is, you know, Mustafa and uh, um, his team have always worked tirelessly to try and ensure that the message of tolerance, the message of um, peaceful coexistence, which are all within the text of Islam. We're not, we're not using frames of reference and terminologies that are outside the religion. And yes. then the, the Quran is telling us, you know, for example, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءً بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come, O people of the book, to a joint word between us and you. The Quran is also telling us that, you know, Ya ayyuha nas, inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. Yeah. That we created you from different races and different tribes so that you get to know one another. This is a very important period and I'm sure, you know, Mustafa could add a couple of points here. It's a very important period for interfaith and intrafaith dialogue. Exactly. You know, we have to try as much as possible and there are many open-minded 
uh, brothers and sisters from all the schools of Islam, we all have to unite with one stand to not only engage in dialogue with people of other religions, but also amongst ourselves, where we mm -hmm. get to learn more about our heritage and yes. certainly try our hardest to remove and to try our hardest to let the world know about how this ideology, the Wahhabi Salafist ideology, is an ideology that is destroying the very fabric of the religion. Mm -hmm. How many youths have been indoctrinated by yes. it? How many families have been broken by it? Yes. How many atrocities and genocides have been committed because of it? Not just today, but in the last couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Mustafa Field, now how would you like to add to the points of uh, Sayyid Ammar when he said the intra-faith and, and the inner-faith uh, dialogues between Muslims and non-Muslims? We have many allies among the Muslim community. Yes. We have many who, who, who will uh, appreciate the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. We need to be firm proponents of encouraging and promoting the reading of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the correct yes. teachings of Islam, the, 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 how the Prophet be upon him, a, 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 a light of mercy on mankind, how he responded to difficult times. We need to learn from how Ahlul Bayt often who lived under oppression in difficult times responded to these uh, tragedies and, and widened the knowledge of Islam where, the, you know, where like lights of knowledge in terms of bringing people through intellectual dialogue, through intellectual um, workshops and, 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 and reading. And, and this is something that's really critical. And this is something that's always been the approach of the Ahlul Bayt. We have never been a religion, uh, we've never promoted violence to adopt ideas. Our way of spreading our teachings is always through being through dialogue and sharing and reflecting on the different texts. We are always willing to listen and sit down with our Sunni brothers, with our Christians, to yes. sit down and share the teachings and bring each other to learn from one another. And it's very important that our mosques, we reach out um, and promote uh, the teachings we have many friends amongst the Sufis who have admiration to the Ahlul Bayt, yes. and we need to show to them why the followership of the Ahlul Bayt is critical mm -hmm. to having a full understanding and application of Islam. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Mustafa Field, uh, a prominent uh, figure from uh, the Muslim community in London, UK. We do thank you for joining us, and hopefully we can continue the discussion uh, in uh, nights. Barakallah, uh, people. May Allah bless you all and bless us. The followers of Ahlul Thank you, thank you thank very you. much for joining us tonight. Uh, now, uh, now, Sayyidina, we do have a, a minute or so uh, to the end of the show. Now, Mustafa Field mentioned a few valid points, uh, if not a lot of valid points. Now, he mentioned something about the reform that we should, you know, take as as Muslims, and, and it's 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 an obligatory upon the Muslims to do that and to confront the teachings of those who really try to deviate the Muslims and bring in new teachings within the religion. Now we do have a minute if you can just uh, briefly talk about that. You know that the spiritual ethical dimension of the school of Ahlul Bayt is something unique. Yes. We have to focus as much on that as possible in this day and age. Exactly. That I advise myself before I advise others. That when we focus on spirituality, we focus on ethics, you'll see the true teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Will be teachings that cannot be equaled by any other school in the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. And it can be the cause of bringing communities together, inshallah. Inshallah. And now the onus is on all of us to educate ourselves of course. with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. And this is a period where we need to use the wisdom, as Mustafa rightly pointed out, of the Ahlul Bayt when facing oppression, when facing situations like this, stand together, unite with one another. Inshallah, people will realize mm -hmm. the true image of the religion of Islam as espoused by the teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Inshallah, Inshallah. Sayyidina, thank you very much for joining us thank tonight. Thank you. Hopefully, we can uh, continue the discussion. And our condolences to the Muslim world. We do, we do. We, we condol everyone uh, you know, across the world because really it affects every single human being out there. You know, if a bomb happens or, God forbid, somewhere around the world, we are affected by it because we are all human beings who should live in harmony. We do like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. As well as you say, Edna. Thank you so uh, much. So do stay tuned for the upcoming episodes. And if you didn't get the chance to view this episode or the previous episodes, you can view our YouTube channel at Imam Hussein 3 TV or just refresh the Facebook page 
and you'll see the recording go back uh, up on our Facebook page. So thank you very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidina.